Well, thanks everyone for coming back for, to resume the session. And uh, of course, it's a delight to uh, welcome Aida al Qadra, who's going to tell us about the role of lattice QCD in precision physics. Aida. Thank you. And uh, let me start by uh, saying just uh, how amazing this is for me to be in this room with all of you, uh, all of my heroes who uh, so much influenced my work over the years. Uh, it's, I'm still pinching myself a little bit to be here. It's really a pleasure. OK, so um, the, the title of my talk uh, is given here, and here's um, an outline uh, of my talk. I'll, I'll start with a very brief uh, introduction and um, will include uh, s some, some history that uh, predates me. Uh, so this is a story that, uh, of course, is well known. We have many places where we need to know things like hadronic matrix elements, and other hadronic parameters with high precision in order to enable precision comparisons between experimental measurements and standard model theory. And in many cases, the hadronic physics, as, as Mike has also emphasized, is entirely non-perturbative, and we need a non-perturbative method. And this is, of course, where Lattice QCD uh, comes in. And what I will try to uh, tell you in this talk is to give you a little bit of a broad brush, bird's eye view of the status. So slides are going to be flying by, and, uh, but I'm happy, of course, to be answering questions. So this is just to pick up where, where Mike's talk, uh, uh, what Mike's talk started. We start with a QCD Lagrangian and with all the approximations that come in Euclidean uh, lattice QCD, Euclidean space-time, uh, discrete discretization of space-time, finite spatial volume, finite time extent. These are all, of course, approximations that we must take away in some way. But these approximations are precisely what enable us to take the path integrals and turn them into regular, very highly dimensional uh, integrals that we can compute on, the compute, on computers using Monte Carlo methods. And uh, then the work proceeds to take these approximations away um, by, um, by using the fact that all of these approximations come with adjustable parameters, uh, as, for example, the, the lattice spacing that can be adjusted by adding more and more space-time points. Of course, this becomes computationally more expensive, and hence studying the uh, continuum limit, which is the world that we live in. And same thing is true for all the other adjustable parameters. In order to claim precision, of course, we must do this with precision. And uh, clearly, this is a uh, large-scale computational effort. Another uh, very important aspect of this, however, is also uh, the how to understand how to take, for example, the continuum limit, how to take the infinite volume limit, uh, et cetera, all of these, all of the uh, approximations and hence limits are associated with a corresponding effective field theory. For discretization effects, we have semantic effective field theory, which tells us that the things that we compute on the lattice are related to their continuum parts uh, by uh, corrections that uh, disappear as positive powers of the lattice spacing. Again, bird's eye view, there can be logarithmic corrections, etc. cetera. Uh, and so the exact form of this depends on the discretization that we choose. And, uh, but this provides us theoretical guidance when we take that extrapolation. And it can also uh, provide us a guidance towards reducing discretization effects, anticipating their size, and so on. Uh, the presence of EFTs, it really is uh, crucial for a serious uh, analysis that uh, makes contact with, with the real world. 
speaking of discretizations, and Mike has already um, talked a little bit about this, um, we have, of course, in principle, infinitely many choices when we discretize uh, a QCD. The different choices will be different at finite lattice spacing, but should all give us the same continuum limit. And uh, these choices might be informed uh, who, who uses uh, what discretization that might be informed by uh, computational cost and what kinds of quantities one wants to study. So the, uh, one of the oldest discretizations are staggered quarks, also known as Koget suskind quarks, whereby uh, the fermion doubling problem, which is, of course, deeply related to uh, chiral symmetry, uh, the, the doublers are kept, uh, reduced, and the, in, order to, uh, in order to distinguish the unphysical doublers from physical flavor, they're called tastes. I didn't make up that name, but it's kind of cute. Um, there are, uh, the, the other oldest discretization are the Wilson quarks that were the Wilson quark action that was written down by Ken Wilson, which avoids doublers entirely at the cost of breaking chiral symmetry. And uh, then there's a lot of hard work to, to uh, remove discretization effects, which are associated with the breaking of chiral symmetry. And then finally, there's been uh, some very, a lot of very interesting theoretical work again, around understanding, a deeper understanding of the fermion doubling problem, color symmetry, and the concept of locality versus ultra-locality um, that uh, all uh, played a role in the development of domain wall fermions and their cousins overlap fermions, uh, which avoids doublers, uh, and so chiral symmetry violations are exponentially suppressed a small discretization effect, but at a, a rather higher computational cost. The other point I wanted to make here is that this is not, this is not the end of the story. This is what uh, many groups are using right now, but there is a continuous development of new ideas of novel fermion actions that you know, people are playing around with, and some of which you know, might become the next thing that is um, answering uh, that is able to, to give us uh, more efficient computations or uh, better properties. Okay, so coming back to what I said about systematic error analysis, all of the, uh, all of the approximations are, uh, can be understood, are guided by uh, effective field theories, and uh, that is essential to using lattice QCD as an ab initio quantitative description of QCD. However, in practice, of course, the, uh, how well we control systematic errors depends on the underlying simulations, how hard have you worked, how many ensembles do you have with different lattice spacing, how small are the quark masses, how close are they to their physical values, how long did you integrate in order to, uh, how, how small are your statistical errors and all of that. So this, this looks good in principle. In practice, there, there are lots of subtleties that, um, that need to be addressed in order to uh, get to the precisions that we want. So this is, a, uh, I hope, a fun slide. Uh, given the, the theme of the conference, 50 years of QCD, I wanted to uh, provide you with a admittedly very selective view of, of lattice QCD history, um, which uh, starts, of course, with Wilson's uh, paper on confinement of quarks and subsequent work, and Mike Kreutz's uh, work on uh, using Monte Carlo methods to study SU, SU2 gauge theory, which uh, all of this led to an explosion in, in, um, in, in work using Monte Carlo methods to, you know, in relatively quick succession, if you look at the dates here, to first lattice calculations in the quenched approximation of hadron masses. The quenched approximation, by the way, was with us for a couple decades or more, I guess. Um, 
whereby uh, uh, gluons were not allowed to split into anti-quark, quark-anti-quark pairs. That's obviously not how QCD works, but um, was an approximation that was necessitated by limitations of, uh, com of computational resources. Now, the, the fun part here is looking back at the, the development is that UCLA used to be a, a powerhouse for, for lattice QCD. In particular, lattice QCD applied to weak matrix elements. This is where some of the first calculations came out that started, that were trying to attempt to address uh, KK bar mixing, the, the uh, how much does, how well does a vacuum uh, approximation work, uh, first studies of the delta I equals one half rule and epsilon prime over epsilon. And uh, I think what distinguishes this work is a, a sense of fearlessness and optimism, which is how we often make uh, progress. Uh, and uh, this, this is seen in the review by Steve Sharp. I just, before I go into that, I just also wanted to point out that it took another 20 years before we were able to uh, perform simulations that included realistic C quark effects, and I'll show you the result of that. So this is not talking about all the studies on confinement and hadron spectroscopy and you know understanding the QCD vacuum better, et cetera. I'm really focused on uh, applications of lattice QCD to, to quantify QCD effects, in particular in, in weak and other rare processes. Okay, so by, uh, I was a graduate student then, by 1989, uh, this was becoming a crowded field of different groups working on different weak matrix elements, and you can see, you know, uh, quite a few things that we actually realized that we don't really know how to do well yet, but we started to do um, uh, already, and including also uh, quite a bit of work on, on uh, the delta I equals one half rule. Several groups were involved in that, and, and epsilon prime. Uh, so much so that this led St Steve Sharp to kind of classify the seriousness of the effort, how much of different uh, systematics and, and theoretical issues were, were under control then. Um, the level? So you want to be as high a level as you can. So, uh, so you know, a lot of people had started working on uh, the, the back parameter for, for the K-on, and, um, and so this is where a lot of uh, computational effort went, and that is reflected in this getting the highest score, a three. Okay, so as I said, optimism and fearlessness. So then in, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we had the computational resources to actually do numerical simulations based on three flavors of sea quarks, not yet with masses that correspond whether, whether the sea quarks provide us with pions that are um, at their value that nature has chosen for them, but within the range of uh, using chiral perturbation theory to guide the extrapolation to the physical point. And you can see this here. So here you see a whole bunch of different hadronic quantities that are computed in quenched QCD, and here in full QCD, three flavor QCD, the charm cork is still quenched. And you can see this is lattice QCD over experiment. You see this beautiful lining up uh, with errors that are still you know, pretty large, but beautiful lining up of, um, of this comparison compared to quenched. So this, is, uh, this was a, a wonderful beacon. To, to at least to me, and then quick, pretty quickly followed uh, actual, again, this is fearlessness, first lattice QCD predictions 
that were subsequently confirmed by experiment, famously predicting the mass of the B sub C meson and, and seeing it uh, measured by the, uh, a month later by the CDF collaboration, the decay constant of the D plus meson similarly and the shape of the form factor. So these are rather different uh, physical quantities that, uh, but these are our first genuine predictions rather than just postdictions. Okay, so now this is an industry and here you can see a table of certain benchmark quantities and you see a history that goes back, uh, you know, over a decade. We all remember that we just had the snow mass process. So I, um, uh, we're using a slide here. And uh, we go from a, a decade ago uh, to, you know, to, to uh, computations uh, where, the, where the errors are still at the few percent to 10 percent level to now where we have a lot of and growing number of computations of hadronic quantities of hadronic parameters that are at the sub half percent level where in fact we need to understand now structure dependent QED effects which is um, which we can't do in perturbation theory entirely because the structure is non-perturbative. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is both a challenge and an opportunity and in fact uh, there are, there's quite a lot of work on, on developing these and computing these now. Um, not having them is a limitation. Okay. So uh, none of this would be possible, of course, with uh, adequate computational resources. And uh, here is a depiction of Moore's law. This is a plot that was prepared by Akira Okawa for uh, McKenzie Fest uh, and, um, and to, to celebrate Paul McKenzie's uh, retirement uh, from Fermilab. And so you, you can see the, the rise, the Moore's law rise in computational resources. And uh, it, it is uh, continuing still. We're now in the uh, exascale era. These are monster computers doing monster calculations. Um, but it's not just all about computational power. There is truly a virtuous circle of uh, theoretical, developing better theoretical methods, uh, the theoretical foundations for understanding the interplay between chiral symmetry, for example, and the fermion doubling problem, uh, better algorithms, code development and optimization, and the, the demands of these computations that feeds into the development of computational resources. They are, they are interesting examples of co-development where um, lattice theorists uh, developed uh, a certain computational platform that was then used commercially, et cetera. So this, this virtual cycle is very important uh, aspect of getting us to the state of the art, which I describe here. So as I already said, we have now results for some select quantities, hadronic quantities that are relevant for precision physics, for flavor physics, with sub percent precision, in some cases with sub half percent precision, and uh, a large number of them, a large number of different groups working on these. And there is, just like there is for the uh, experimentalists, there is a flavor lattice averaging group um, called FLAG. That's a catchy, um, that's a catchy abbreviation, which is taking the results and evaluating them and, and uh, packaging them. So if you want to know what does lattice QCD have to say about quantity X, you can look it up in the flag review. Okay, uh, the other aspect is that the uh, scope of lattice calculations is increasing rather rapidly. And in some cases, we're circling back to, to problems that, uh, that we started with and then went to look at simpler problems. So, uh, the delta I equals one half rule in epsilon prime was a, a passion of the UCLA group and uh, Amarjit Soni has been driving this program 
uh, has been driving a program for the RBC UKQCD collaboration to compute these with, uh, with great success. Uh, we will hear about work being done on uh, structure on PDFs. Uh, there are ideas and there's uh, pilot projects for computing inclusive decay rates. Um, we get access to scattering uh, parameters, etc. So it's, um, it's, uh, the scope is, is truly exploding. Okay, now I want to give you uh, a couple of success stories and then uh, a puzzle. Uh, so one success story, uh, this comes from a slide that Raja Bukazal presented at the P5 town hall at Slack. And the point that she so beautifully made is, which was uh, already also made uh, by, by Frank, thank you very much, is that QCD is essential to understanding Higgs physics. This is truly a a uh, situation where we have all hands on deck and uh, we need to know, um, well, electroweak corrections, of course, but we also need to know uh, perturbative QCD corrections at high energies, they are perturbative at high precision. We need to know the input parameters alpha sub s and the quark masses, and we need to know the PDFs. So this all looks kind of uh, perturbative to you, however, as Mike already emphasized, the QCD parameters, the quark masses and alpha sub s, really are non-perturbative parameters and they are best determined using lattice QCD. And uh, in fact, the, the best determinations come from lattice QCD and they provide now very precise inputs that address the demands of precision Higgs uh, decay rate measurements. Uh, I think Zhang Dongji will probably talk about the future of lattice QCD inputs for, for PDFs. Okay, another, uh, so just to show you a little bit of the status, um, let me not go through the slide, but just to say that in order to do a lattice QCD calculation, the parameters of the QCD Lagrangian, which are the same in the lattice QCD Lagrangian must be fixed with experimental measurements, just like we must fix the electron mass and alpha from experiment for QED calculations. And then everything else is a pre or post diction. Uh, in order to turn these tunings to, into uh, determinations of the renormalized coupling and the quark masses, typically we must do additional calculations we might compute on the lattice additional short distance or long distance observables like Wilson loops, current current correlators, the heavy quark potential, and these computations together with this uh, input setting can then be used to obtain renormalized uh, alpha s values to also compute non-perturbatively the evolution of the strong coupling uh, and similarly for the quark masses. So without going into the details, there are a number of different, and we call them observables too, observables that are being used to uh, obtain a renormalized alpha sub s that can then at some high scale be related to MS bar. And the FLAG collaboration has performed this service of, of uh, evaluating these different determinations and summarizing them uh, into, into one average. So I want you to keep in mind when you look at the PDG's average and you see this one lonely lattice point, that's a lot more than one point. That's a compilation of dozens of different uh, papers and determinations of alpha, alpha sub s. Okay. Similarly for the quark masses, I, I don't want to really explain the color scheme, but the, the, the point of these plots, which you can't read, really is to show you that there are a lot of different results available. The filled green ones are the ones that enter the, the averages, uh, and we now know these, these quark mass parameters to very high precision using, again, completely independent calculations and different methods and different observables. Uh, and by the way, in this case, the PDG still has to catch up to us. Okay, now for B quarks, there's, a, there's an additional story because B quarks are so heavy and they're small and we used to have this, this picture that the B quark mass is uh, so heavy that its Compton wavelength kind of falls through the lattice spacing 
uh, that we can't resolve this with the lattice spacings that we had available those uh, 20 years ago. And uh, the picture isn't quite right because uh, we have the uh, EFT picture of using heavy quark effective theory on a QCD. These, uh, the B and charm quarks are inside bound states. Those bound states themselves are much larger and we don't need to really resolve the scale of the B quark. We need to resolve the scale of the bound states. So we can use effective field theory methods also to describe heavy quarks. And there's an interesting story of co-development of EFTs for heavy quarks, both in the continuum and on the lattice, that has uh, yielded um, uh, important results in both cases. Uh, and then with the advance of computational methods and also theoretical developments, better understanding of how to improve the light quark actions and how to match to heavy quarks, uh, we, we can, in some, in some case, come full circle where we can now use relativistic light quark actions to resolve the B quark or begin to resolve the B quark. And this is where we get to sub percent precision also for B quark physics. That's the um, bird's eye view again. So when we look at uh, how is this relevant, what, is the, what, are, what are the implications of this? What is the impact of all of this precision? And here I'm giving you another, another example uh, in B physics. So uh, one of the uh, quantities that is being measured, actively measured by LHC experiments is the rare decay of a leptonic decay of a B sub S meson into mu plus mu minus. This decay is loop-induced, that, that's what makes it a rare decay, and hence it is one of our prime candidates for searching for signals of new physics, because when something is loop-induced in the standard model, it's loop-suppressed, there is room for uh, beyond the standard model physics. And this is, of course, uh, what we are looking for in order to um, in order to improve our understanding of, of nature, of course. Okay, so you might wonder, well, where does the standard model prediction come from? It's, uh, it's uh, um, listing here a Fino paper, and uh, the standard model prediction comes from a uh, calculation by Benneke and all, where they took the uh, lattice QCD uh, evaluation of the decay constant that describes how B meson annihilates into, um, in, into the electroweak operator in this case, uh, and, uh, and then also includes structure-dependent QED corrections and also assesses the uncertainty due to CKM matrix element VCB, which dominates here. So the awesome thing, if you look at this, is that the contribution from the pure lattice QCD uh, parameter to the error budget is subdominant, and in part because the structure-dependent QED corrections are not well, that well known. That's now new homework for us. There's new non-perturbative parameters that we could, in principle, compute in principle. So this comes from you know, this, this sort of effort of, of uh, computing this parameter in lattice QCD and consolidating it with uh, lots, of different, uh, lots of other lattice QCD calculations. OK, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to um, see what my time is. I still have time. OK, so the other, uh, the other story I wanted to tell you is the story of the hadronic corrections to muon G minus two, uh, somewhat by popular demand, and there's another, of course, connection to UCLA here. Uh, and this is less of a success story, but you will see that we are getting close, uh, we being the lattice community, and we also perhaps being the muon G minus two theory initiative community, but we'll see. Okay, so that's my, that's my next uh, uh, topic here. So just to, to uh, get started with the usual introduction, we are, I'm now talking about leptons, which a priori don't really have much to do with QCD, and the magnetic moment of a lepton, 
which uh, on the theory side then is uh, the magnitude is driven by this g factor, which Dirac predicted to be equal to two, but which in the quantum field theory uh, of this field theories of the standard model will get modified by um, usual quantum effects loops. The first of these was computed by Julian Schwinger in uh, 1948, I think. Uh, and he, he found this famous result that has now been engraved on his uh, tombstone. It was very important piece of establishing QED back then as the uh, correct quantum field theory that describes how electrons and photons uh, interact with one another and um, you know, establishing it as the flagship theory of the standard model that it is. Okay, so in principle, all uh, sectors of the standard model contribute to this blob, and, uh, and the anomalous magnetic moment is defined as the difference between G and 2. So again, this is a rare quantity. It's a loop-induced quantity. So again, it's interesting to uh, use it to confront theory and experiment. In particular, in this case, the uh, uh, for the muon, the anomalous magnetic moment can be measured very precisely. I won't tell you exactly how, but maybe you saw the recent announcement by the Fermilab experiment um, that is measuring G minus 2 um, of a new measurement that reduced their measurement uncertainty to an unprecedented 200 parts per billion, and um, they have already um, a factor of four or so more data in the can. This is, uh, in the end, something like 21 times the statistics of the Brookhaven experiment, which, um, which was running in the late 1990s. Okay, so on the experimental side, uh, precision is, is rapidly progressing. In about two years' time or so, this error bar will be reduced by probably another factor of two. But as you can see on the theory side here, on the standard model comparison, there's question marks here. There's um, different points on here, and I'll talk about that. So the situation is less clear, and those are the puzzles I want to talk about. OK, so just to give you a very brief overview over where the standard model contributions come from and what are we worrying about is uh, it's not, OK, somehow this disappeared. So let me just give you the upshot that probably everybody knows. QED, done. Five loops. I mean, that's, those are amazing calculations. Those people are true heroes as well. Um, you know, over 10,000 diagrams computed, et cetera, known to uh, a precision that affects um, muon G minus 2 at, at the level of one part per billion. So experimentally, it will take a long time to, to match that. Electroweak, done to two loops. Uh, again, it's something like 10 parts per billion accuracy. So if that was all there was, we wouldn't be talking about muon G minus 2. But I'm talking about it here because the hadronic corrections which start at order alpha squared, uh, are difficult to compute. And uh, there's the hadronic vacuum polarization over here, and there's the so-called light by light, hadronic light by light over here. So these kinds of, this is a two-loop diagram that exists also with leptons in the loop, charged leptons in the loop, which are part of the QED calculation. But when you have quarks in the loop here that at low energies immediately create hadrons, then this hadronic vacuum bubble is, again, a non-perturbative object. And so is this hadronic vacuum bubble is a non-perturbative object. This one, of course, is a two-point function. That one is a four-point function. For the two-point function, dispersive methods can be used to relate this to uh, cross-section measurements. So this is an old uh, story. Um, or we can be bold and use lattice QCD. 
OK, so the old story using dispersion relations is rewriting the integral in terms of the hadronic cross section uh, is, is shown here. So, you know, just written as that, as a, as a theoretical uh, integral, it looks very nice and is very clean. Um, uh, and, uh, but of then, of course, all the work comes into measuring these cross sections. And this has been going on for over 20 years with, uh, with better and better methods. Um, for the light by light, there is a new dispersive formulation now available, uh, not entirely complete, but that has already quantized, uh, quantified quite a lot of the, um, quite a lot of the previously less, less well-known uh, uncertainties. Okay. And of course, we can use lattice QCD. The uh, fly and the ointment, if you want, for using a dispersive approach together with experimental measurements is that we have to assume, well, I mean, our experimental friends, you know, are, are very uh, clever and know how to do these measurements. So we have to assume that they're correct, of course, but we also have to assume that they are not themselves contaminated by new physics. So it is obviously desirable to have a direct calculation that only assumes the standard model, that only assumes QCD, and that is what lattice QCD provides. So in this case, the hadronic vacuum polarization correction can be written in terms of an integral over a Euclidean time correlation function. So in one case, we need to integrate and measure cross-section and integrate over this. In the other case, we need to compute correlation functions, two-point functions, and, um, and, and more point functions and integrate over that. So two different avenues that should give us the same answer. For a quantity as important as this, where there's such a big experimental effort, of course, it's good to have more than one approach and hopefully agree. Okay, um, so to, I, I will not talk uh, too much about this, but to, oops, something weird happening here, but, uh, but to uh, streamline this if you want and to uh, really understand the different methods and, and have reliable assessments of the uncertainty estimates, we formed the muon G-2 theory initiative. And as you can see, we've been talking to each other a lot, also through the pandemic. And this really involves the entire community, experimentalists, C plus E minus, low energy experimentalists and theories, theorists, um, dispersive um, perturbation theory and, and lattice theory. Uh, and the entire community came together to provide um, a standard model prediction prior to the first release of the Fermilab experiment. And uh, we're continuing to work on that. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to skip this slide too. I don't know what happened here. Um, that's, uh, that was giving a summary of the comparisons between um, for the hadronic vacuum polarization and for the light by light. The upshot of the story for light by light is we have direct lattice computations. We have dispersive um, evaluations that still have some model dependence in them at the 20 to 25 percent level. Everybody agrees with each other very well, also agrees with the old model dependent evaluations. Uh, so our, our friends who, who were doing these computations uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, got the light by light amplitude uh, correct. For the hydronic vacuum polarization, the situation is a mess and we'll come back to that. So here's a brief overview of the status for the data-driven dispersive approach where you have these compilations from many different experiments to build the hydronic cross-section. This is shown here as the sum and here shown as the individual components. And at the precision level, basically, what we need to know very precisely is the pi pi cross section that dominates the, um, the contribution to the anomalous magnetic moment, the hadronic vacuum polarization contribution, as you can see here, and also dominates the error. That's this, this yellow area here. This is a log scale. 
Uh, and uh, so measuring this cross-section uh, to, to, to a precision that is needed to get to sub-percent precision is, of course, difficult. And there are many, there's actually a handful of different experiments that have done that and are continuing to do that. And there are some famous tensions uh, that existed when we were looking at the situation in, in, um, up to including 2020, uh, which, uh, which is summarized here that led then to a conservative way of combining um, all of the information we had, taking into account those tensions. So then uh, an earthquake happened in uh, February of 2023 with the CMD3 uh, collaboration um, providing a new measurement that's out here. So now we have tensions, these differences that are uh, up to five sigma, we claim when we see a difference of five sigma, we claim that we might have discovered uh, at least very strong evidence for new physics. Nobody's claiming that this needs to be resolved and there's been a, a lot of work um, working towards re a resolution, but this is an ongoing story. So that's why there are all these question marks and arrows on the comparison plot, which I'm hoping will continue to show up. Um, I'm going to skip this. I just wanted to say that there are uh, several experiments that are sitting on data. The Babar experiment is sitting on data they collected 20 years ago that they haven't analyzed yet. That's actually a larger data set than, than what they have analyzed so far. And they're promising a new result, uh, a, a new result. They're doing their analysis blind um, based on this larger data set by next year. Okay, so other experiments are also working on this. So this is not static. We're not stuck with this. There's also a lot of work on a better theoretical treatment. Again, there's those structure-dependent QED effects that we should understand better, and there's ongoing work on that. Okay. Now for the lattice side of the story, of course, lattice QCD is QCD. So in QCD, we deal with the uh, quark and gluon degrees of freedom. So instead of summing over hadronic cross sections, instead of summing over hadronic channels, we are summing over the quark flavors and then connected and disconnected ways of, uh, of computing the correlation function. And the picture is not so different from before uh, because this is a low energy quantity. The contributions from light quarks are dominant, and so those need to be computed with the target uh, precision, and then heavier quarks successively contribute less and less. The disconnected contributions here, they're called disconnected not because they're truly disconnected. What you have to imagine here, what I didn't draw, is a quark-gluon background. So these are connected by gluons, of course, but uh, very, very noisy, very difficult to compute. And then, again, in order to uh, to uh, compare apples to apples, we must also include QED corrections, which we can do, including structure dependence. Okay, so uh, there are quite a few challenges with doing this in lattice QCD, and uh, this is why you don't see results yet with sub half percent precision for this quantity, but I'm telling you that they're coming. Okay. Um, going to skip this. Uh, I told you that the, um, I told you that the, we compute the hadronic vacuum polarization contribution as an integral in Euclidean time of a correlation function that we compute in Euclidean time. I also told you that there are a number of different challenges. Different regions in Euclidean time provide a different mix of systematic errors, and in particular, statistical errors grow with Euclidean time. We understand why, but we still have to deal with that. So that's the reason why, when we came out with our white paper result, the lattice uh, evaluations basically had such a large uncertainty that they didn't weigh in and weren't used. Um, but then BMW, the BMW collaboration came out with the first lattice QCD calculation with sub-percent precision, um, just a little bit less than a percent precision. 
in famously in tension with the data-driven hadronic vacuum polarization evaluation. And uh, then there is also these further tensions for what we call the intermediate window, where basically, instead of integrating over the entire Euclidean time range, you cut out a Euclidean time range that's in the intermediate distances, where we don't have to deal as much with discretization effects, short distance effects, and where we don't have to deal as much with um, long distance effects. And, um, in early 23, this is the situation. So now we have a consolidated uh, picture for this simplest quantity to compute the intermediate window and further comparisons between data-driven uh, evaluations where you can try to remove all of the contributions and isolate the light quarks uh, and comparing that with lattice evaluations, you can see that um, that there is a significant tension, three and a half to four sigma, and the primary source of the tension are the light quark uh, contributions. So we have a puzzle that we need to understand. Of course, this is with the data-driven compilation that predates the CMD3 result. Okay, so there is a lot of ongoing work, and what I can tell you is that I expect by next year to have several independent lattice results at sub percent precision. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, by 2025, if we don't have any tensions, if the picture is as before for the intermediate window, then reducing this to the half percent level is entirely feasible. Now, uh, what about is so special about the year 2025? As I said, this is when we expect the Fermilab experiment to release their next result. And we want to have, again, like we did in 21, we want to have a prediction so that, um, so that we can um, see once and for all what's what with, with this quantity. Okay, so uh, this data point here is the BMW data point. And as I said, this will be replaced uh, very soon, hopefully next year or so, by a data point that provides a consolidated lattice QCD pre prediction, uh, comparing results from different groups and you know, uh, doing a, a method average similar to what we did prior for the, in the white paper. And as I also said, with CMD3, we really don't know what the data-driven method is telling us right now about the hadronic vacuum polarization. Um, I'm not putting any data points on here, I'm just putting question marks on here, because how do you average results that are incompatible, that are five sigma different? Well, you don't, you need to, you need to see if, if um, you know, what, what is wrong, what are the reasons for this. But we will have more information that will, that will give us um, uh, more that will give us hopefully resolution here. And in fact, CMD3, the CMD3 collaboration is continuing to work on this as well, trying to understand why they disagree with their previous CMD2 uh, measurement as well. Okay, coming back to the big picture, I showed you um, uh, a few results here uh, that are, and some of them are what we call lattice QCD flagship results that come from different, uh, many different lattice groups computing things in, in, in to high precision and, and agreeing on the calculations. And uh, as, as I told you, the uh, hadronic vacuum polarization and hadronic light by light is uh, very quickly moving into the flagship territory, but there's a lot of work being done that um, on, on other quantities that are at various stages on this complexity scale um, as, uh, and, and will, you know, will become uh, more precise uh, as, as people continue to work. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. 
I just wanted to also point to there's lots of stuff that I could have talked about that I didn't talk about. Some of this will be, uh, will be covered uh, by other people, but uh, it's a very rich field. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aida. Uh, uh, a question from Arkady. Uh, thank you. I am just trying to, to get your opinion, you know, about this tension, uh, you know, this uh, CMD3 and uh, uh, lattice calculation. My understanding, uh, uh, I mean, and I'm certainly uh, very interested in this uh, stuff, uh, that um, uh, if I say we accept the BMW results, uh, you know, for the latest, uh, then independently on CMD3, then uh, 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 if, uh, and also actually these windows which you mentioned, which are kind of confirming, you know, BMW, if you will take this uh, phase value, then it means that all this old experimental cross-section were uh, uh, below theoretical expectation. And, uh, and it's not just G minus two, it's just, uh, I mean, uh, there is this uh, real, real tension between the QCD prediction based on the lattice and those experimental results. Uh, okay, uh, CMD3 maybe, you know, would, Take the stage, uh, but but uh, so you think that uh, it is still you, you doubt uh, this latest result, or we, we should <laughs> take good. it as well and say that all this old experiment are still uh, inside. No, I mean below below expectation. Okay, um, so this uh, you know. As I said, we have this consolidation for this intermediate window. This was the easy part. It's about a third of the total. And comparing, uh, comparing this against the R ratio results without CMD3, there is this three to four sigma tension. I mean, that's a puzzle, right? Uh, so there's not a question of me believing BMW or not, you know, we have lattice results that are consolidated, the prior to CMD3 results. This is an emerging disagreement that we want to understand. You know, is this some, has this something to do with uh, cross-section measurements? You know, are there systematics in there? It's kind of hard to see that given the differences in the different, you know, you have measurements that are based on initial state radiation coming from very different center of mass energies. You have the scan measurements. I mean, even forget about CMD3, right? You have all of these different measurements. There are some tensions which are telling you that this, these, these measurements are hard, uh, but is there something kind of common that's really wrong? Um, and maybe, maybe one of the things is, is CMD3 is telling us is the case. CMD3 isn't entirely done, I would say. Um, one of the things at the workshop we had last week they agreed to do was to take their data and look at the anal and use the analysis methods that they used uh, for the CMD2 measurement to see how well they compare because they don't understand why, why their previous measurement differs so much from their new measurement. So, I mean, it's, it's a mess. Uh, any explanations that talk about new physics, right? You know, what's the next thing? We have a three to four sigma, three and a half to four sigma difference, new physics. I think all of the models that people have built are, I think you might call them torturous. Of course, you can never, you can never exclude any torturous models. Uh, so yes, I would say this is a big problem. I would also say, however, if, um, if, the, you know, if we have a completely consolidated lattice result for the hadronic vacuum polarization, that's what I would take. I'm not quite ready to, to claim BMW yet. Um, you know, we'll have to see. 
for the total HVP. So the total HVP could still shift around because this is only the intermediate window is only a third. Um, you know, patience, my friend. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> <laughs>